الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد If the sisters don't mind appreciate it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He blessed us with the deen of Islam and the deen of Islam is not a deen that began with the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, but rather all of the Anbiya from the time of Adam alayhi salam till the Prophet, the last of all the Prophets, Khatim al Nabi'een, Al Mustafa alayhi salatu salam, have been on the same religion of Islam. And they've brought the same message of Tawheed and the same message of the oneness of Allah and the obedience of the Prophet of their time throughout their times. But one thing we fail to understand as an ummah is that the deen of Islam didn't come for us to become rich in business or for us to become uh, necessarily governors or kings and so on. At times, Allah gave the kingdom to the Anbiya. For example, Sulaiman and Dawood and so on, they were, Allah gave them kingdom and Allah gave them wealth. And they were successful in their kingdom and their wealth because they obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at times, Anbiya were slaughtered and killed and they didn't get that worldly victory as far as wars and so on, but they were successful in the fact that they still obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the deen is not meant for us to become rich. Because sometimes people ask, oh, you know, why are the Muslims in this country, in this condition? Why are the Muslims the poorest in the world? Why are the Muslims struggling? Why are the Muslims, why isn't Allah opening up the treasures and so on? But this is a misunderstanding. The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to save you from a nar, from the hellfire. And at times it will require sacrifice in this dunya that you will not get anything back in this dunya for it. But you will have the akhirah. And that is why for this deen, the anbiya, they spilled their blood. There's a hadith and the explanation of this hadith, at tabari he brings some of the aqwal of the sahaba. And there's a beautiful hadith about the patience of the anbiya. And it talks about, and it's in, actually in tafsir of an ayah, but I don't want to get too off topic, but it talks about 70 of the prophets that were killed by the Bani Israel. Bani Israel, they killed 70 prophets in a day. One of the Sahaba explained, he said, this is where Baytul Muqaddas or يعني, Majd Al-Aqsa in this area where the rock is, this is where it was. And then he speaks about, one of the Tabi'een, he speaks about two of the prophets that were killed. And they were not the ones on the same day. But these are two prophets that are father and son and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to them directly as mentioned in the Quran. And this is Zakaria alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam. There are three people we can say bin Nusus with evidences that they got a name that was not named before. One of them being Yahya. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this name for the prophet Yahya that nobody had before him. The other two are in the hadith about Hassan Hussein radiallahu anhuma. And they were also, both of them became shuhada, one poisoned and one killed. So these were people that sacrificed their dunya and went through that hardships, but they knew their reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah. Some people Allah will give them futuhat in dunya. Sometimes Allah will give the Muslims victories like Dhul Qarnayn and how he was made victorious and a king and so on. And we look at the Khulafa and Allah gave them victories on the Romans and Persians, but I want to emphasize the point that that's not why we do it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an amana, a responsibility to convey a message and rule by that which is right, that's our job. And if hardships come, then patience is our job. And if the victory comes, then being thankful is our job. And if Allah chooses to make us shuhada, then we are thankful for it. We're not ungrateful, why us? Why were we being killed? Why? No, Alhamdulillah. This is why the people of Sabr on the Day of Judgment, they will have a special status. 
They will be entering Jannah, some of the Malaika, some of the Nusus they mention. The Malaika, they will wonder, why are these people entering before Hisab? They said, we are the Sabirin. When they had Sabr in dunya, Allah gave them that. Yahya as a Thawri and others have mentioned, he was asked a ruling by one of the Bin Israel, one of the people that claimed to be from the believers of the time. And the ruling was about marrying somebody that was not mahram. And he gave the correct ruling and Yahya السلام, was killed for it. And Zakaria السلام, was killed for it. Anbiya who were mentioned in the Quran killed. Why? Because they stood on the haqq. Does that mean they failed? Never. So when we see our brothers and sisters becoming shuhada, we shouldn't think, oh, Allah has left us. No, this is the victory for them and a reminder for us. We look at some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and one of the Sahaba that many of us don't even know about today. His name is Abu Aqil al-Ansari. We spoke about him in the Seerah Durus. But Abu Aqil al-Ansari is a Sahabi that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he did the fundraiser. And you know, today we would say fundraiser. He encouraged the Sahaba to give for Tabuk. So many of the Sahaba, they brought great amounts of wealth. Uthman ibn Affan radiyanu, he brought tons of wealth. Stacks high. Abu Bakr radiyanu, Umar radiyanu, we know the famous hadith of them competing with each other and bringing. Abu Aqil al-Ansari, he didn't have anything. He had nothing. Like today, we give from our extra. Like we have our houses, we have our cars, we have our wealth, we have our account, we have everything. We have food stocked up. And then the bank balance that we have extra, maybe we give a little bit. And if we give like one tenth of it, then mashallah, we did so much. But the Sahaba, they gave so much that they literally would not have food in their house. So Abu Aqil Ansari had no food for his family. So what did he do? He went the night and he worked. And he got two handfuls of dates. And he had to feed his family, of course. So he gave one handful for them. And the one hand the sa'a he had left, he went to give it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't save it in the house. He didn't keep it for himself. He didn't say my reserves, no. But now when he's going, he comes to the masjid and he sees stacks of the sahaba that have given generously, he feels shy. And the munafiq will always try to discourage you. When you want to do something good, munafiq will always discourage you. Who cares about your da'wah? Who, what's your lecture going to do? People have heard it already. What are you going to do that's new? They always want to discourage you. So the munafiqun, they were sitting there, they were joking, they were making fun of Abu, Abu Aqil al-Ansari. They said, what's your little handful of dates going to do? It's a big army. You're going to take on the Romans. A little handful of dates. He felt shy, but he also felt shy that how can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam encourage us to give and I don't give. So if that's all I have, I'm going to give. So when he came with just that handful and that I'm reminding you because as the Shaykh was saying, even if you have a dollar, give. You never know. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, take from this handful and put it on top of all of the mounts of sadaqah that's come from the barakah of his little bit of sadaqah. So that little handful, they took a little bit and put it on all the mounds. Why? Because Abu Aqil al-Ansari had that ikhlas. That when he had nothing, he still gave. That same sahabi, when the battle of Yamama happened, many of us know about Badr and Hunayn and Uhud, but one of the harshest battles in the history of Islam was Yamam. Because this is the time where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi has passed away from this dunya. And the Prophet Ali sallallahu he saw a dream where he had two gold bang, uh, bangles or, or bracelets. And gold is haram for men, obviously. But this is a dream. But even in the dream, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi didn't like them. He didn't like it. And he blew and they blew away. And he said, these will be the two liars that will come in my ummah. Huh? One of them, Al-Aswad, Ansi, 
from Yemen and the other the Musaylim al kadhab from Yamama. Yamama is not Yemen. Yamama is current day Saudi Arabia in the middle of it. And this is the area where the horn of shaitan and so on. This is, this, these are indications about Musaylim al kadhab So Musaylim al kadhab is one of those two that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa spoke about. And he was there in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he was quiet. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, him and Banu Hanif, they stood up and they had strong tribal connections. And they said that, they, that this was a new prophet, Musaylim al kadhab That now he is the prophet, even though he was a liar. But because of nationalism, his people stood with him. So when this happened, at a time where the ummah was in a time of, of friction anyway. The battles because of Tabuk and, and so on, the hostilities with the Romans had begun. The hostilities against the Persians was beginning. And now within the Arabian Peninsula, you had this revolt and a man who claimed to be a prophet. So here Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he sent the Muslim armies. And I mean, because of time, I'm not going to go deep into it. We discussed it in the Sira Durus and so on. You can watch them. But there were very harsh battles. But Hanif, they had more people than the Muslims that were being sent against them. In some of the narrations about Yamama, the Muslims were around 12,000. Some of them mentioned more or less. But the, the Murtaddin, the people who had become Murtad, the apostates, they were around 100,000. Some mentioned 60,000. The largest I saw was 112,000. So there would be 100,000 more than the Muslims. Even non-Muslim historians have said the Muslims were outnumbered at minimum 1 to 10. And Musaylim al kadhab had the home front advantage, meaning it was the battle was being fought in his land. It's not like they were coming to Hijaz. So here it became a very difficult time. And Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu was brought. And the battle was harsh. And they gave the banners to the different Muslims from different areas. So the people who Muhajirun, the people who made Hijrah, the banner was given to who? Zayd ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And that is the brother of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And the banner of the Ansar in the beginning was given to al-Barra ibn Malik. Anas ibn Malik's brother from the Ansar. Zayd ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu becomes a shaheed in this battle. And when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu hears about this, he cries. He said, he surpassed me in two khair. He became Muslim before me and he became a shaheed before me. The same Abu Aqil al-Ansari, the one who brought the dates, during the battle he's hit, either with an arrow or a sword between his heart and his shoulder blade, where he, the left side of his body becomes paralyzed. So now he's not able to fight. He's paralyzed on the side. His leg is limping. So he goes to where the Muslims are and he's treating the wounded. And they see that he is unable to fight. But now, Ma'an radiallahu anhu, one of the Ansar, he sees Musaylim al kadhab army becoming dominant. So he calls the Ansar to fight. Abu Aqil al-Ansari, he's unable to fight, but when he hears this, he gets up. He's unable to hear that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is collecting and he doesn't give anything. He's unable to hear that the deen of Allah subhanahu wa is in need and he doesn't go. He's unable to stand that the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs people to fight and he's not fighting. So even when he's injured, he gets up. And the people that are treating, they're telling him, where are you going? You can't even lift your left side. Your leg is limping. You can't go. He said, I have my right. And he said, I hear man calling the Ansar. And I'm from the Ansar. How can I not respond? And he went and he fought. And he fought until he, the last moment of life was left in him. And at that time, he's not worried about his money. He's not worried about his family. He's not all he's worried about is the victory for Allah or not. These are the stars. These are the people we should look up to. These are the examples that, that wrote their name in history with blood. 
These are the shuhada. At that time, he gets a hold of Abdullah ibn, ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, the son of Umar ibn Khattab. And he tells him, who is the day for? Abdullah ibn Umar tells him, don't worry, the victory is for Allah and his messenger and the deen of Allah. And he becomes happy. And it wasn't easy. When the Muslims, they pushed back and Musaylim al kadhab he fell back. He didn't just surrender. They went back into the Hadiqat al Mawt, into the Garden of Death. And this, this was a place that was a farming area that was walled off. And they locked themselves in, even though they were greater in number, but as cowards, they locked themselves in, knowing that if somebody comes in, they would have the full advantage of them. And knowing that the Muslims couldn't get through the gate. So here now, it's at a standstill. Khalid and Walid, he says, we're not going to go away. Because the victory has to be decisive. If we just back out, then tomorrow they will raise their head again. Until Musaylim al kadhab is killed, we will not surrender. We will not stop, we will not have a truce. So at this point, the Muslims are stuck. The enemy is forded off. You can't get to them, they're not coming out. They're not opening the door. And the walls are high. So Barra ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, a true hero, he said, throw me over. He said, what do you mean throw you over? You have a whole area filled with the enemy. If we throw you over one person, what are you going to do? Some of the historians that I was reading earlier, it said that 10,000 of the enemy were killed inside. So imagine how many were inside. One person. But this is a lion. In a rijal. See, victories don't come from living normal lives. Like many people today, you know, when you go out and you, and you spend a lot of time outside the house, and like today, alhamdulillah, the brothers, they went out to give da'wah. And it's not a comparison, but alhamdulillah, the brothers from Fresno are here, mashallah. We had a person take the shahada, right? But at the same time, it was stressful. Sheikh Kareem, mashallah, almost got into it today with a few Islamophobes. And he was that close to fists. Huh? Many other people came and yelled things. People came up in faces. Twice today, it was, it was, it was at the point where we thought, I mean, somebody's going in handcuffs, right? Why? We could have gone to the beach like other speakers and had a nice dinner or lunch and tea and relax and gone home and relax. So why? Why go through this stress? Why go through these hardships? Why leave your house? Why leave your family? Why? Because this is what Allah has ordained upon us. Why did the Sahaba leave their families? They didn't just sit at home with their kids and play. No. Abu Aqil and Ansari could have stayed home. He wouldn't have been hit with arrows and swords. But no, history and victories are not made from sitting at home. They're made with sacrifice. And everybody's level of sacrifice is different. Barra ibn Malik radiyanhu here, he says, throw me in. So they lift him up on shields to put his feet up high. And they get him up. And he looks over. And as the Tabari and others have mentioned, he sees nothing but a sea of swords of the enemies of Allah and his messenger, the apostates, with swords pointing, looking up. That who, what is this guy coming from? And he's thrown in. And one man, subhanAllah, one man pushed them all back and opened that door. This isn't a movie, it's not Hollywood, it's not DC, it's not Marvel, it's not make-believe. These were real people who gave real sacrifices. And when that battle took place, Abu Dujana radiallahu anhu, who becomes a shaheed himself, and Wahshi radiallahu anhu. Imagine Wahshi. You know who's Wahshi radiallahu anhu? The one who was responsible for killing Hamza radiallahu anhu. So at a time when he used to walk, even after Islam, 
people would see him and say, this is Wahshi, the one that killed Hamza. But that day he got his opportunity for redemption. Because many of us may have done a lot of wrong in our lives. But Allah gives you that opportunity. If you're alive, you still have that opportunity to change your life. To change yourself from being remembered for something bad to being remembered for something good. That day Wahshi, he used that spear to kill Musaylam al kaddab And Abu Dujana then went and finished him off. From that day on, the Sahaba said, we used to then see Wahshi and said, that this is the man who killed Musaylam al kaddab It changed that perception. Barra ibn Malik became a shaheed that day. Abu Aqil al-Ansari became shaheed that day. But the victory came that day. Musaylam al kaddab was killed and that whole fitna was put down. And the foundation for the da'wah and the futuhat in the time of Umar ibn Khattab were laid down. So this reminder is for myself first and foremost. That when you are sacrificing for the sake of Allah, don't think your sacrifices are wasted. When you are being patient to hardships for the sake of Allah, know that Allah sees you. And know that Allah hears you. And know that Allah is the one that makes the decisions. And when Allah sees that sacrifice, even if our sacrifice is not at the level of the Sahaba, even if our sacrifice not at the level of even our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, even if that's not there, but that small amount of sacrifice we do today, whether it's money we donate, whether it's time that we give, whether it's we're patient with people calling us names or attacking us, whether we are patient upon the haqq, upon the Qur'an and the sunnah and the way of the Salaf al-Ummah, even when the world is selling out, even if we are patient when people call us names and people give us you know, all kinds of fake titles and this and that, even if we're patient to that small amount, it's something heavy in the scale of Ar-Rahman. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa talked about us. Those that will believe in him, those that will follow his sunnah, those that will have imsak, that will be firm upon it, even though we haven't seen him, alayhi salatu salam. In person, we haven't seen him. Huh? But we believe in him. We, 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 we try our best to be upon his way, upon the aqidah that he taught us, upon the manhaj that he showed us, upon the sunnah that he brought to us. So he's told about us, insha'Allah, that he told his ashab, his companions, the best of mankind after the anbiya, he told them that these people will come and one of them will be like 50 of you. Even though the, the, the status of sahaba is higher, no doubt. But Rasulullah sallallahu gave them this glad tiding. The Sahaba, they were surprised. They said, who are your ikhwan? Who are your brothers? Aren't we them? He said, no, you are my ashab, you are my companions. But my ikhwan, my brothers are those that will come after you, that will not see me. They will not see me like you see me, but they will believe in me. And they will follow my, my commandments. And they will be firm upon this religion, that they will be like 50 of you. They said, 50 of them? He said, no, but 50 of you. Why? Because we are in time of fitin, in the times of trials and tribulations. So when we stand firm upon this religion, then our small effort, our small sacrifice is heavy in the scale of Ar-Rahman. So what's the point of these conferences? What's the point of these shuyukh? And tulab ilm and du'at, leaving their countries and leaving their homes and traveling and going through those hardships and coming here is to revive the sunnah. To go back to the kitab. In a time where our imma are telling us to lock arms with lesbians and gays and to take funding from governments and, 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 and people who are trying to misguide the youth, where people are telling us to zip and where people are telling us that yani, leave the hijab and niqab and these things are insignificant, leave the beards and leave talking about aqidah and, and unite upon kufr and whatever. And in these times of fitna, those young brothers that I'm looking at, that I'm looking at right now, standing firm, inshaAllah, 
and a tawfiq, the ability from Allah upon the Quran and upon the Sunnah and upon the way of the Salaf al Ummah, this is the true victory. This is the victory that the enemies of Islam will not be able to overcome upon you. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu told us, this is the glad tidings he gave us when we walk in the streets and people look at us as if you're strange, when we walk into masajid and people tell us you're strange. When we tell somebody that no, we cannot compromise on the deen and people tell us what's wrong with you? This is glad tidings, your ghuraba. That tree of Tuba in Jannah is for you. When our sisters are in niqab and abayas and gloves and people look at them and call them ninjas and when Muslims are mocking them, don't worry, these are glad tidings for you. And when you are firm on that, then even if you are one person in the whole town, you will be victorious. Let them bring their people. Let them cancel whatever they want to cancel. Let them go and and, and, and make plots with the kuffar, with the munafiqoon, with the hypocrites. Let them make their plots. Wallahi, when the nusra of Allah is there, nobody can overcome us. So that is the point. That we unite and stand firm together. And inshallah, this conference, as the ones we've had before, all the way from New Jersey onwards, every one of them, wallahi, yani, it, it, it makes me have hope. Because this is the weekend. All these young brothers and sisters could have been at clubs. They could have been at, even, I'm not even talking about just clubs with drinking and alcohol. They could have been bowling at you know, MSAs. They could have been uh, out with, with safe spaces in Masajid where brothers and sisters hang out together and say, sister, mashallah, your skirt's looking amazing. And she's like, brother, your biceps, mashallah, you're working out. You know, They could have been sitting, selling out the religion, but instead, Alhamdulillah, they're here for hours and hours speaking, listening to lectures upon lectures. Why? Because this is the people we hope from Allah. I and mean, we, we don't know the hearts, we hope from Allah. This is the people of ikhlas. This is the people of a taqwa. This is the people of the Quran and Sunnah. And inshallah, this is not ending and it's not getting less, it's only increasing. Around the world, everywhere Muslims are waking up. Don't get discouraged by events in, in, in the news. Know that almost 2 billion Muslims are waking up. The slander, the sleep we were in, we're waking up. And inshallah, inshallah when they wake, wallahi the victory will be for us. So don't worry, the victory is from Allah. But the most important thing, not just me and you. Today, at the end of this conference, take this message of the Kitab and Sunnah to your communities, to your Masajid, to your MSAs, to your homes. Revive it. Speak about what you learned. Share that knowledge. So this revival will be global, inshallah ta'ala. All of you guys ready, inshallah? Inshallah, khalas. We'll open up the Q&A for a good 10, 15 minutes only, and then we have dinner. Inshallah, we'll be...